Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. A question that we should ask ourselves frequently is this. Is God pleased with me? Now, I didn't ask, does God love you? Did he send his son into the world to die for you? Has he forgiven you? None of those questions did I ask. All of those questions are important, but here's what we need to be focused in on today. And that is, is God pleased with me? And when I say that, I'm speaking about our behavior, our actions. Is God satisfied with my life, how I'm living? When we look at Isaiah's prophecy from the book of Isaiah chapter 22, it is clear that God is not pleased with Jerusalem, the inhabitants of his holy city. Because in this chapter, we're going to see a, a prophecy against Jerusalem. So with that said, to got your Bible and look with me to Isaiah and chapter 22. In this session, we're going to look at the first half of this chapter. And notice that it does not come out initially by saying that this is against Jerusalem. We have another description of this place. First of all, when we look at verse 1 of this 22nd chapter, we have that familiar word. It is a prophetic word, a word that speaks forth the fulfillment of a vision. And God has a vision for this place, and he uses the word, as it's said here, the word Massah, which is a burden. It is a weight. It is to bring someone down because they are walking in pride and for the purpose of exalting oneself or one people. And constantly see, not just with Israel, but as we've encountered other nations, we see that same word, burden, as a prophetic vision against a, a nation, a city, a people. And such is the case here with the holy city of Jerusalem. By behavior, this city is not manifesting holiness. It is not a city that reflects the purposes of God, not walking in his instructions. But there's a very unique description of Jerusalem here. We read a burden, and some Bibles will say against, and it's certainly a vision, a proclamation prophetically against, but it simply says a burden. And then we have the phrase, valley of vision. Now, what this is saying is the following. God in this prophetic burden, he has a vision. And in speaking of Jerusalem, he identifies her as a valley. This does not make geographical sense because you go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a mountain, and therefore, when God sees it as a valley, what he's saying is that he is going to, through this burden, he is going to make it low. He's going to bring humility to this city. He is going to take the pride of the people, and he is going to humble them in a shameful way where they're going to experience, hear this, they are being prophesied as being defeated by the enemy. So a burden, a valley of vision. 
what is to you, therefore, meaning what is the cause of this? And what is this? That you, all of you, go up to the rooftops. So they go up to the top of their homes in order to, to perceive something, to see. And what is that? Well, we're going to have without any uncertainty. This is a proclamation of warfare against Jerusalem. And the people are going up, all of them. This means no one is escaping. There's no exceptions. Jerusalem is going to go through a bitter defeat. And the people are going up on their rooftops in beholding this army that is coming. Look now to verse 2. Now, in verse 2, the first word that appears here is the word teshuot. Teshuot is a word for noise, but it's in the plural. So there is abundant noise and much noise. And then what's interesting is the, the editors, and I'm speaking about the sages, they required the scribes to put a line after that word to show that in one sense it stands alone. God wants us to realize that what is being done there is that there's a great disturbance, there's a loud noise, and once again, this word noise is in the plural. There's much sounds going on, and none of it, speaks about that which is good. So, noise. And then it speaks about a city. A city which is full, and we have a, another word that refers to noise. This is a word for kind of a, a humming. And many times in the scripture, this is used to describe a city where everyone's talking about something, and usually the same thing. There is an event that causes the city to be a buzz, to be speaking about this. It captures everyone's attention, this noise. And once more, we're going to see that this noise is, is coming because of the armies that's coming against Jerusalem. It says, the city, the city of Aliza, a city of joy. Now, Jerusalem is supposed to be a city of worship that depicts the holiness of God. And holiness, one of the byproducts of living a sanctified life, is indeed joy. But this is not what the city of joy is going to be experiencing because it's far removed from the purposes of God. Therefore, they're not going to receive what God wants them to have, joy. What are they going to have? Well, now it speaks about your corpses, your dead bodies. It says, but not dead bodies from a sword and not dead bodies because of war. Now, we have something that's unique because in a few minutes, we're going to see as we read, there are horsemen, there are chariots, there are, are warriors, soldiers coming. So why is it now, because of this great noise, this humming, this buzz going through the city? And it's speaking about dead ones, but not from the sword and not from war. How do we understand this? Well, most scholars see this as speaking of their spiritual condition. It is not the enemy that has brought about this death that describes the city, but it is their disobedience, their sin. They are spiritually dead. They are separated by their actions. God's not pleased with them. And therefore, there is not the life of, of, of God being implanted in these people, a spirituality, but they are, are dead spiritually. Look at verse 3. And because of this lack of God's presence in the people, leading them, guiding them, instructing them, what happens? Look at verse 3. All your, and this is a word for, for 
officers. Now, it can be related to leaders, but usually a katsin is someone who is a high-ranking official, a leader in modern Hebrew, in the army, or in the, the police, among the police. So these are leaders, but usually in regard to defense. Not so much political in nature, but, but military. And it says, all your officers, what do they do? This is a word for wandering about aimlessly, having no vision from God, no direction from God. So they are, are confused intellectually. They don't know what to do, and they don't know where to go. But what are they doing? Well, they're fleeing from the city. And this foreshadows an exile. So they all together, they are wandering and they are captured by those who have the, the bow. So the, the enemy that has a bow as a weapon, all who are found of you, they are, are captured all together. And from a distance, they flee. So there are those who are being taken prisoner, those who are captured and being placed in bonds, chains, we could say, and there are those who are fleeing. But here's the key. The emphasis is they are leaving Jerusalem. They are cut off from that holy city. And that means from the presence of God. Verse 4. Therefore, I have said. Now, who's speaking here? It's Isaiah the prophet. And he's speaking here, look carefully. Therefore, I have said, look from me. Meaning, don't cast your eyes upon me. Why is Isaiah saying this? He says, because I am weeping bitterly. In bitterness, weeping and do not hasten, do not hurry. This is a, a modern Hebrew word, or it's used in modern Hebrew for acceleration, for, for pushing the accelerator down in a car to travel quickly. And he's saying, don't quickly, don't hastily comfort me. He doesn't want to be comfort because this is very grievousome. This is bad news. He says, concerning the plunder, and this is a word showed for plunder, and it's a plundering that leaves uh, things empty and in desolation. The daughter of my people. And what he's saying here is usually daughter speaks of a future. She will get married. She will have children. It speaks about a future, the daughter of my people. And here Isaiah, he's grieved because when he looks at what God is revealing to him, he sees the people not having a future, that God is judging them severely, and therefore Isaiah is weeping about this bitterly and does not want to be comforted. And what is this? Look at verse 5. For a yom, a day, the word yom in Hebrew is day. For a day, mehuma. Mehuma is, is kind of a, an uprising, but in this sense, it's just a disturbance. There is a degree of, of confusion among the people. And not only confusion, but the next word, here's the word, u mevusa, which is defeat. So the people there, they are disturbed. There's an uprising. Everyone's moving about. And they have been defeated. And furthermore, this next word can be speaking as well as confusion or shame or embarrassment. Now, I went through all the words very carefully in this text. And I'm translating them as I always try to do in a very literal way. But as I look at other English translations, I see that there is great differences among many of them. People adding words and such. 
and not translating the words in their normal meaning. So we look at this verse, verse 5, and it speaks about a day of, of disturbance, one of defeat, one of embarrassment or confusion. And then it says, this belongs to, who's the source of this? It is the Lord, the Lord of hosts, in the valley of vision. Now, this phrase ties, there's no question we're talking about Jerusalem, we'll see this in a moment, but it ties the first part with what we've been studying. This is the vision that God has. He is bringing it about because of the spiritual condition of the people. In, in one reason, and that reason is, he is not pleased with them. And that's why I began this, this session with asking you that question. Is God pleased with you? Are you doing, behaving, obeying what you should? Or have you been like Jerusalem, the inhabitants of this city, where each one went his own way for his own purpose? Look now to the last part of verse 5. It's a word of destruction. It says, destroying the, the wall and crying to the mountain. And that may be the mountain referring to Jerusalem. And the wall might be that sacred wall referring to the temple. So it foreshadows exile. It foreshadows being out of the city looking back and the city is in utter ruin, in utter destruction. This is what Isaiah is speaking about. And we can understand it literally as an army coming, and we're going to see evidence for that. But there's also a spiritual devastation. And that is when the people are following not the instructions of God, but being led by demonic influence. Look now to, to verse 6. Here, two peoples are going to be spoken of. We have the first at the beginning of verse 6, and Elam. Elam has to do with Assyria. Elam lifts up its quiver, so it's speaking about weapon, and in the chariot of men, and soldiers, and here are horsemen. So it speaks here of Elam, this Assyrian nation, part of this empire, that they are coming with chariots, with men, with horsemen, and also Kir. What's Kir? It is an important city in the nation of Moab. So we have Assyria and also Moab being referred to. Mighty nations, Syrian empire, and it's coming against Jerusalem. And notice that, that Kir, Moab, has, has uncovered her shield, meaning that it's getting ready to march forward into battle upon the city, verse 7. And it shall come about that your choice valleys will be full of, of chariots and horsemen. And they will be placed at the gate. And here it's a, a play on words where it says that they will, the word for putting appears twice. They will utterly or certainly be placed at the gate. And this all foreshadows a defeat. And here's the message for us. Many times people want to take something practical from this prophecy for their own life. And here's what we can conclude. When God is not pleased with me, the enemy's coming and I'm going to experience defeat. I'm going to experience pain, suffering, loss. And I'm not going to have the perspective to know even what to do. Verse 8. And he uncovered, this is the enemy, he uncovered 
the Masach. Masach is the, the screen of Judah, meaning revealing what, what shielded it was all uncovered. And I interpret this to mean that now nothing's being hidden. Those secret sins, that, that security that they trusted in, all of this is being removed. God is uncovering. He's making everything quite, quite transparent before him. And you shall look, this is Judah, you shall look in that day, Be'yom Hahu, a phrase of judgment. You should look on that day too. And it's very interesting, this next phrase. Neshek bet ha ya'ar. Now, neshek is weapon. And bet ha ya'ar, ya'ar is, is force. What's in a force? Trees. So the house of the force, what is that referring to? Well, they brought the lumber from the forest to make the temple, and the people trusted in that temple. We see the prophecy of Jeremiah also accounting this. They felt because that temple was among them that the enemy would never have victory over Jerusalem. That they held as their security and their weapon against any attack from the enemy and Isaiah is saying in this passage of Scripture, look again. He says, look on that day at, in essence, and I'll translate it kind of in a paraphrase way, in that weapon that you thought was going to provide security for you, the temple. Meaning the temple is going to be destroyed. Verse 9. And the... And this is word for splitting something, breaking through. And it speaks about the, the breaches in a, the city, in the city of David. Now we know we're speaking about Jerusalem. So there's going to be breaches in the, the city, the walls of the city of David in Jerusalem. And you will look and there's going to be many of them. And you will gather the waters of the lower pools. Now, this is an act of desperation. Now, you might recall, if you have read and studied the prophecy of Jeremiah, Jeremiah told the leadership when Nebuchadnezzar was coming, just go out and surrender. Because it's really not Nebuchadnezzar who is, is bringing this judgment upon you, but it's God. And you need to submit, you need to simply receive with confession the punishment that God has placed. But these individuals, they are making a stand. They are hoping to survive. They are in a desperate situation, but at this time, they are taking precautions in order to try to survive. So they are gathering together the walls in the lower pool and the homes of Jerusalem. Another clear reference that this prophecy is about Jerusalem. The homes of Jerusalem, you have counted and you have uprooted, that is, you have destroyed them, these homes. Why? To fortify the walls. So they've counted how many homes are necessary in order to, where the walls have been breached, in order to fill them up. And also, we know something, a city without water can't survive very long at all. So for their security, they've strengthened, they fortified the walls of Jerusalem, and they've also taken matters into their hands to secure that they're going to have enough water. Verse, verse 11. Now we have the word mikvah. Many of you know this word mikvah. It's a, a reservoir of water, a source of water. So we read here the source of water, this reservoir of water that you made between the walls. Here it is. It's so precious that it's reinforced among, in between the walls of the city. He says, 
for the waters of the, the old pool. But you did not look to. They went back to the oldest source of water, which is probably the best one. And they, they reinforced it, but they didn't do something. They didn't look, and this may be an idiom for prayer, they did not look to the one who made this reservoir, the source of water, who formed it. But from a distance, they did not look, meaning the one who was so distant, they didn't look towards God. They only saw the situation in the immediacy, meaning what they could see with their own eyes, what they could do with their own hands. They didn't think about the one who was far away. And who is this? God. They didn't give him any consideration whatsoever. And this is why they're in the situation that they are in. Verse 12. And the Lord, and this is the word Adonai Hashem, the Lord, the Lord of hosts proclaimed, in that day now this is the second time we've seen that expression which refers to judgment a time of judgment so the lord called out the lord lord of hosts in that day for weeping for lamentation and for being a bald head which means it's an act of repentance to shave your head and also to gird sackcloth so god is saying you haven't looked to me, I'm far away. You haven't looked to this one who is far away from you. I have called, I have proclaimed now what you should do. You are taking physical action in order to try to survive. But what you really need is to take spiritual action. You need to do what? Notice what he says. You need to weep. You need to lament. You need to shave your head and put on sackcloth. Gird yourself with sackcloth. Now, Isaiah, what was Isaiah doing? The same thing. He was weeping. He said, don't comfort me. It's a time of grief and sorrow. But is that what the people are doing? Look now to verse 13. Verse 13 shows that there is no tendency there's no place among the people to really turn to God, to want to repent and believe that God will be forgiving, renew his covenant, and save the people. They're doing everything they can physically, and they're making no spiritual preparations, taking no spiritual actions whatsoever. Look at verse 13. I'm going to translate this very literally. And behold, in the midst of these desperate times, what do they do? Well, you're going to see that in verse 13, they realize something. They realize the futility of their actions. That all their effort, all their physical human efforts that they've done is not going to preserve them, provide for them victory. They are not going to endure. So what do they do? Instead of lamenting and crying out and weeping and repenting before God, there's still an opportunity to do that. But they have no interest in that whatsoever. What do they do? Again, verse 13. Behold joy and gladness. They are doing one last time a party. They want to rejoice. They want to make for themselves pleasure. They are going to, to kill the calf. They are going to slaughter the sheep that's left. They are going to eat meat, and they are going to drink wine. They say, let us eat and drink. Why? Ki machar. Because tomorrow, Namut, we will die. Now, the last thing they do, they give no thoughts whatsoever to God. 
the age to come. In their last moment, they want to please their flesh. They want to satisfy their belly, their palate, with, with meat and fine wine. They want to have a feast and then what? Die. Now, let me tell you what they did not know, what they did not believe in, and that's this. They believe, sure, there's enemies in this world. There's conflicts. There's wars. They understood that. They could read the papers. They could hear the reports of different places. They knew the history. But they really didn't believe what they were experiencing was judgment from God. Remember, what does it say here? God is Merachop. He's far away, far away from their thoughts, from their actions. They do not believe in an afterlife. Tomorrow we die. That's it. It's our end. Let's celebrate one last time before we reach the end. But they do not believe about what's after death. That was totally uninteresting to them. They gave no thought to that. Look at verse 14, our last verse for this study. And it was revealed in the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now, this is an idiom basically saying, here's God's perspective on this. And he says, Im yukupar he avon haze. Avon is iniquity. So this iniquity, it's not going to be atoned for. The fact that God mentioned it shows that he was willing to, but it's not. In the language, it's the word if, meaning if this iniquity would be atoned for, it's outside of God's nature because of the spiritual condition of the people. There is not one place among them for repentance. So what's going to happen? It says, this, this atonement for you is not going to happen. Rather, what's going to happen? Death. You will die, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Two different words for Lord Adonai and Hashem. He's saying that the people, because they did not give consideration to God, did not believe in an active, intimate God that was part of every aspect of their life. Nothing goes on in this world that God's not aware of. God is active. And when you do not realize that, when your life does not reflect that, you are going to live a very displeasing life before him. And the outcome of that is death. So let me ask you again. Are you living a life that's pleasing to God. Is he pleased with you? That is something that you and I, we need to ask ourselves daily. When we get up and when we go to bed, God, I want to live and make decisions and do things in this new day that's going to be pleasing to you. And at the end of the day, do what's called cheshbon nefesh. We take that spiritual inventory and ask ourselves, God, my behavior, how I managed, how I ordered my steps, what I did and what I didn't do, are these things pleasing to you? You will understand this point, and that's this. If God is pleased with you, you will have joy for eternity. But if God is displeased with you, and I'm speaking to believers now, if God is displeased with you, when you go before the judgment seat of Messiah, that beamer, and he makes you to be known as he knows you, that is, you'll have a divine perspective of yourself. 
That's one of the reasons why it speaks about when heaven begins, that he's going to wipe away tears. Let's not be in that situation. Let's live a life that's pleasing to him, which means what? That we base our decisions, our actions, upon the truth of Scripture. I'll close with that. Until next week, and we do the second part of this 22nd chapter of Isaiah. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>